Well, I'm joined by Tom Greatrix from uh, the Nuclear Industry Association. Tom, I mean, first of all, your reaction to COP, it's crazy, I think. It's incredibly busy, but what's good about it, I think, is that there are so many people here with the same commitment, which is about how we best decarbonise and, you know, do good things for the, for the economy and the environment at the same time. And that's what's, I think, gratifying about what you're hearing over the course of the last few days and the next few days. Uh, is this the COP where, from the UK point, standpoint, we can say, nuclear, your time has come? Well, I think what's really good this year is there is a, uh, a recognition that net zero needs nuclear. And it's not just about the UK, it's about countries across Europe, it's about China, it's about Canada, it's about the US, across the world. People understand that you can do a lot with variable output renewables, but you can't do it all. And so nuclear has a part to play in that future uh, energy mix to decarbonise. And that's something now which I think has got much more acceptance than it had even a few years ago in Paris. With the announcement from Kwasi Kwarteng, the extra money coming in, I mean, it's a, it's a significant chunk, the idea of, you know, developing more sites. Is it enough? Well, look, we've got a fleet now which in the UK is retiring. It's yeah. coming off. You know, Hunterston in the next few weeks will come off here in Scotland. On Tuesday, when David Attenborough was speaking, when uh, uh, Joe Biden was speaking, the power that coming to the south of Scotland was 75% nuclear. It was low carbon, but it was nearly all nuclear because it wasn't windy. So, you know, the part that nuclear plays currently with our current fleet is significant in the UK, but it's retiring. It's getting old. It will stop generating in the next few years. So we need that new capacity even to stand still. I spoke to Caroline Longman from the National Nuclear Laboratory, and we had a great conversation on our podcast, but it was all about the kind of reticence about nuclear being still big. The idea of the small modular reactor, is that actually a reality? Is it something that we would see? Because in some ways she said, look, it's about the perception for people that you, need, you see something like Sellafield, or you see what's being built at Hinkley, you think, A, it's going to take forever, B, it's enormous, look at that footprint. Are small modular reactors actually a way of getting us nuclear in a way that is more acceptable to the public? Well, I think it's more about there are sites that modular, small modular construction suit better than large scale. But, you know, just think about the large scale. It's actually a very small geographical footprint compared to what you need to do to try to get the same amount of electricity from any other source. So it's incredibly compact because of the density of nuclear energy. But look, small reactors will be suitable for some sites. It's not an either or. It's about how you best get that mix to get the firm low carbon power we're going to need, not just for the electricity, not just for grid electricity, but for wider decarbonisation as well. On the public still buy that they don't want it. And what is the industry doing about cleaning up the waste? Because that's the real, I think, psychological barrier. Well, the interesting thing I think about waste from nuclear is most of the waste from nuclear is heat. You know, it is completely benign. And unlike other energy sources that belch greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which is causing the climate catastrophe, we don't do that. We don't get any of that from nuclear. Um, but you do from other energy sources. But what we do with nuclear, uniquely actually amongst energy sources, we're responsible for the waste, the waste, the high level radioactive waste, which is very, very small by volume, but we know what to do with it. We know what to do with it for years. We vitrify it and keep it in um, concrete casks. And there's a debate about whether that should be stored on surface or underground. But the important point is, one, it's small by volume. Two, no one has ever been injured or died as a result of any, um, anything to do with uh, that waste. And thirdly, we know what to do with it. We know exactly what we're doing with it. And that is not causing the climate issues which comes from other energy waste. Extinction Rebellion were here yesterday outside. We, we meet loads of eco-protesters and they all like low carbon. They want clean. But they don't see nuclear as low carbon. Your disconnect is still there. Why? Well, I mean, I think this is really interesting psychologically. I think actually it's a bit, it's a bit less stark than that. You've got increasingly climate scientists talking about nuclear in positive terms or you wouldn't have had that a generation ago. You've got lots of young activists and people that have been involved in Extinction Rebellion who are saying, look, nuclear is really an essential part of, of dealing with climate change. Um, and so people understand, I think, increasingly, we're not there yet completely, but understand increasingly that there aren't any carbon emissions coming from nuclear. It's as clean as any other energy source in terms of lifetime emissions. And therefore, it's an important part of the future because it provides something which other energy sources don't. And the combination of those together are the, what we need and we want to be very powerful in, in dealing with climate change. To end with, what are your aspirations for the nuclear industry after this COP? Well, what I, what I hope we're, and we're starting to see is an understanding and recognition and acknowledgement that we need nuclear as part of that future mix and to start doing it rather than just talking about it. And I think that by the time we get to the next five-year COP, we'll have more projects underway around the world that are about delivering that clean energy we're all going to need.